Thank you. Uh, first, uh, let me thank the organizer for uh, for the invitation and for putting together this uh, very nice uh, workshop. So uh, I changed my title a little bit. So in fact, the writing of the uh, the talk is a evolving process. So. Uh, now I put in a little bit something more, so I put the N more, so, all right. Uh, here is the outline of the talk. Uh, I will begin with some motivational examples of high dimensional HJBs. Um, we, in the past uh, two days, people have been, you know, colleagues have been talking about the different high dimensional HJBs. But here I gave you a little bit different uh, taste and uh, different examples. And then the second part, I would talk about uh, some numerical examples. In fact, uh, two examples. So to, two in the first part, two in the second part, and then some further remarks and to, to uh, close the talk. Well, uh, all right. So, uh, because I'm doing stochastic control, so naturally the first question is, you know, or the first problem is stochastic control problems and the high dimensional HJBs. Uh, the second problem, what I'm going to talk about, in fact, a specific example is actually the time inconsistent control problems. Um, now, then the next one I'm going to talk about, basically, those are the two parts I'm going to concentrate on the example part. The, the, the second example is mean field type of control for switching diffusions. I'll, you will see what that is. Actually, at the very beginning, I was thinking about the concentrating on this part, but it, because, you know, the, in the talk, what I'm going to talk about this stuff actually is quite new. We have just done that pretty recently, so I thought maybe an interesting stuff to talk about that. All right. So uh, this is the first part for new motivational examples of high-dimensional HJBs. Now. The first problem I'm going to talk about, by the way, in the talk, I'll mention uh, the problems and also the co-authors uh, involved. So I'll acknowledge their, their work. So the first one is not so classical LG, LQG problem. So if I'm, if uh, everyone is talking about the LQG or uh, LQ problems, you think that this is a control theory 101. Everyone knows how to control uh, linear quadratic regulator. So here I'm adding a diffusion term, so the Brown motion. And uh, AT, BT, and the sigma T are suitable functions of T. And U is the control. The new angle, however, is that the terminal cost is not quadratic with respect to the terminal state. Uh, but in the distribution of xt, x is the state variable. So in other words, we no longer have the quadratic terminal cost. Then what happened? Well, uh, well, first uh, you will ask the question, uh, do you have uh, kind of applications problem behind. In fact, there is a problem, the so-called Markowitz mean variance problem. That's if you walk into a, a like mutual fund uh, manager, you say that I would like to invest $100, then the guy will ask you how much return you would expect to have within a year. And what is the tolerance you can, you know, you can take for the volatility? So those are the kind of mean variance control problem. Markowitz was the one actually got a Nobel Prize in 1950s for his work on mean variance control problem. And then later on, this was extended in the in the uh, early. 2000 or so, we also work on some of the problem. 
But this is the, actually one of the problem of that form. So what you have here is expected value of xt, the terminal uh, state, but you are taking the expected value of that and you square that quantity. This becomes non-classical. So the traditional HJB approach does not work at all. Now, this is a so-called is a, a class of new stochastic control problem. That such uh, problems are called, you know, time inconsistent control problems. So basically, that tells you the decision maker's preference change over time, but it's not consistent uh, with another uh, point of time. So basically, the Bellman's uh, principle no longer works. So then what we do with it? Uh, well, the time when we look at the problem, we actually use the you know, completing square to solve the problem. But later on, there is a work by, by York and XYZ, we, uh, you know, Xun Yu Zhou, we, normally people call him XYZ uh, from Columbia. So they look at the problem in 2014 using a, a game theory kind of approach. Now then in 2015, uh, Zhu Yun uh, did a paper on this. Now currently he's developing a new theory on this time inconsistent control class of problems. So basically here, what he was trying to do is trying to solve the time inconsistent control problem by using, basically trying to find the time consistent solution for time inconsistent control problem. It's a recursive optimization problem. So I would uh, suggest that if anyone is interested in, you can look at his uh, uh, recent work. This one has appeared in uh, AMS, uh, uh, you know, the AMS journals. Now here, our uh, idea is to treat the value function by increasing the dimension of the space with the addition of the probability law. So that's the new part of it. So basically what you do is that we of course have a state variable X uh, or the diffusion associated with that control the diffusion. Then we look at the corresponding probability law or probability distribution. Now, for simplicity, I'm going to illustrate that use uh, just a uh, scalar problem. Scalar problem, even you have this. Then you can define, uh, define this uh, inner product or pairing or whatever you, you, you want to call it. Then this mu square uh, bracket mu to the m, in fact, is the m's moment. And then you can define the derivative associated with the measure. So you are actually working a collection of uh, Baru measurable functions from, you know, uh, you know, from the metric space. So then the problem change, right? You can write down the corresponding value function. So notice the value function is no longer in the original control u, but in the measure mu. So uh, then we write down for simplicity, I'm, I'm using B as, you know, just the linear. And uh, so the running cost is quadratic in U, only that term, no, no uh, quadratic in X term. And uh, the terminal cost turns out to be of this form. All right, then what happened? Well, but then we can define some operators. Those are just details, so we don't have to worry about it. But then what's uh, happening is that what you can show is that the value function turns out to be of this form. It is quadratic, all right, but it's a quadratic in the measure, not in the, not in the, the, the U anymore. And you can look at what is the, oops, sorry. You can look at what, uh, so in this case, 
this is the steady equation. Well, here is the, the uh, cost function we are trying to, to minimize, for example. And the, uh, but then what you have is that you have this optimal control is in terms of the measure. So the measure turns out to be an infinite dimensional stuff. So now let's look at a particular example, very simple one. I simply have the, uh, the diffusion to be ut times dt plus dw. Not, you cannot have a, you know, simpler than this, right? Here is your running cost. Here is your terminal cost. Turns out to be just the terminal state take the expectation raised to the second power. But it's non-classical anymore. So the, uh, you know, the Bellman's principle doesn't work in this case. I can use the operator I defined. I can work out the detail. And then the optimal control turns out to be something like this. Xt star is actually the optimal trajectory corresponding to the optimal control. You see the value function, in fact, is integrated against this measure. Again, this measure is infinite dimensional stuff, and you square that quantity. And so that's really one of the first example I'm going to talk about is, you know, it's a high dimensional problem, but it's different from uh, what we were uh, looking at before. You know, it's from different angle uh, than rather than the state variable. What about if the state variable is high dimension as well? That's also possible. Our a way of thinking is we did some numerics for this as well. So our way of thinking about this is that we hope to get first a benchmark example. And so we can compare the result to high dimensional, high space dimensional problems. All right, so that's the first uh, example I, I'm going to, uh, I, I was going to talk about. Now the second example comes out from the work we have been doing that for a while. It's something called a switching diffusion. So I, I put in some reference here. So uh, if you are interested in, you can look at those. Uh, those are paper in Saikon, Saikon, Saikon. This is a book we produced. Now, what is a switching diffusion? Now, let me look at the case. Uh, this. In fact, you have a both discrete state and also continuous state. So here I have a three discrete state. They are, uh, you know, in this picture, uh, are put in there as, as uh, three parallel plans. On each of the plan, there is a diffusion going on. So at some point, some random switching take place. So from one plate, or from one plan to the, to the other, the time is random. And then jump again to another plan, follow another diffusion, and then follow another diffusion. Notice that my curves are relatively smooth because I couldn't really draw the, the uh, crazy uh, curve like a Brownian motion. So, but uh, Using your imagination, that those are not really the regular curves uh, as a smooth curve here. So this is the sample path of the switching diffusion. I put in a quotation mark because it's what I drew here is not quite uh, the Brownian motion type. Now, so how such thing comes about? Why you want to consider such problems? Basically here you have two things. You have a continuous dynamics and you have a discrete event. They both exist, they coexist. Switching is used to model random environment or other random factors. So there are a bunch of problems. In fact, we work on many of those, including something like a non-cooperative games uh, or, or consensus control target tracking and so on and so forth. So a key, point is that uh, the traditional ODE or SDE models are no longer adequate. We need uh, something like a mixture of this. So 
the distribution is not Gaussian. Now, uh, but that's not exactly what I was going to talk about. The one I'm interested in actually is the mean field limits uh, related to this. This is the joint work with uh, my former students mentioned here. And here uh, you have a, I, I'm sure everyone is uh, uh, aware of the current literature on that. So I mentioned the work of a Cass McKean, and especially the work of uh, Dawson in 1975. Actually, Dawson's uh, motivation uh, may come from physics, statistical physics. So in physics, you know, uh, many body problems are known to be hard. So physicists has long, uh, have the very good intuition of how to treat such problem. What they said is the following. If you have many bodies, it's very hard to, to do that, to treat the problem. So why don't we look at the problem by looking at the average, use one representative, which is average of many particles to represent the whole system. Uh, it turns out his paper had a lot of uh, reactions. He really proved the physicists used for a long time, but no uh, mathematical proof for a long time. So the problem was as follows. First, he proved a law of large number type of thing hold. And then he proved the uh, transition, phase transition from one phase to the other take place. Uh, so this becomes very uh, uh, influential. Now in the late, I think late 80s or 90s, people, uh, two different schools, uh, the one from France is by Lyon and his associate, and also in the in the can in Canada is by Peter Keynes, Huang, and uh, and so on so forth. Their collaborators they were starting looking at uh, uh, mean field control and the mean field game problems. Uh, I also mentioned a couple of problems. Now this one is the Graham's uh, work is close to ours. It's a switching between two states uh, with time changing. Uh, Color cost of work on nonlinear Markov process is also related. Um, if uh, Fariba and uh, Mac are here, you know, so you, you remember uh, Vasily used to talk about this. Now I have a better understanding of, uh, of this for the non Markov process. So let me uh, say what the problem we are going to look at. So we have uh, many particles. For each particle, it satisfies the following equation. So this is the drift term. This is the diffusion term. So U is the control. W is the Brownian motion. Now, what is added here is the, uh, the mean field term. It's one over N delta x, j, and t. Well, this one just, uh, you know, like an empirical measure, basically. Now, uh, so what we were looking at uh, is basically looking at uh, this problem. But uh, so there are two things. One is the mean field term. Many people have been looking at this. But when they look at uh, the problem, there's no alpha involved. We have uh, switching diffusion. So the alpha, the right stuff, is in here. This complicated the matter quite a bit. So the so-called mean field control or mean field game problem basically is that we have this, then uh, we are going to replace this by a limit measure. And then the corresponding problem you can solve will be depending on the measure as well, similar to the first problem I mentioned. But here it's quite different because there is a switching involved. So we were trying to redo like the LQG problem with switching, but with also the mean field term at in. We were trying to see what, what the, the control would be. We have a good intuition for that. 
However, we didn't know quite how to get the limit. So that uh, really led us to look at, to investigate what the limit should be. It turns out that this part is quite interesting. I have a one page here. So the, uh, the limit, uh, the limit turns out to be a stochastic mckeen vlasov equation that was in the stochastic processes and the applications. Then there is a maximal principle in the French journal. So basically, to make the long story short, we can say that uh, the, there is a limit. The limit, in fact, is a unique solution. Uh, it's, it's a law. Uh, the law is given by this uh, right equation. Uh, what is interesting is that, you know, before, for most of the people who look at the problem of mean field game or mean field control problems, the limit measure at least is deterministic. But in our case, this is a random. It depends on the history of the Markov switching process. So, uh, so here the next two uh, or three lines actually tells you the main difficulties. So very often you are trying to get the limit by using Martingale problem formulation, but it doesn't work in this case. Now in Kurtz and Hume's work, they were looking at a bunch of stochastic PDE, uh, infinitely many exchangeable particles. Uh, but they can use it. Argotic theory, however, this is not available to us. We use the mean field, uh, a conditional mean field. I should mention the work of Bakhtan, Li, and Ma. They also use the, this, this uh, conditional mean field. Basically, is for treating uh, partially observable systems. And there's also a work of Kamana and Zhu for using probabilistic approach treating major and uh, uh, minor players. So they use a conditional expectation or, or probability to, to treat the uh, condition on the major players. So now, uh, so naturally, once you get a such a problem, I have to say for this part, we haven't done any computation yet. And in fact, our next uh, uh, project or next uh, step is to get the corresponding HJBs. Turns out to be rather, rather difficult, but oh, I think we should be able to do it. It uh, looks like we have a good handle on that. But later on, we'll be looking at the, the numerical solution part. Naturally, this will be high dimensional problems as well. So basically, I give uh, two examples of uh, uh, motivational problems uh, for the high dim dimensional control problem. Now I'm going to switch gears, talk about uh, some numerical examples. Uh, because everyone is doing, not everyone, uh, a lot of uh, colleagues here uh, have talked about, you know, using learning idea to trade the problems. I'm going to talk about something like this as well. As I told you, some of the stuff we have done is uh, relatively new. In fact, it's, uh, as you can see, what we'll, we'll, we'll mention. So we have a, a number of people have to talk about the control problems, but uh, uh, so no one, at least uh, uh, in this, uh, workshop has talked about uh, filtering. So we are going to talk about something about uh, filtering here. So this uh, is uh, familiar to everyone here. We are talking about what is a deep neural network. We use DNN to denote that. And uh, uh, so the deepness of this uh, Network is measured by the number of layers used. We consider the fully connected neural net and we do back propagation. Um, and uh, well, then we need a cost function, of course. 
So our idea is that we are, of course, uh, filtering is interesting on its own right, but we also would like to do uh, partially observable controls at some point. So this is a really the first step in that direction. So, so here we need a, a data set consists of fixed pair of input and output variables. And we have a fit forward neural net. And uh, uh, the parameters with width theta. And we have a lost or error function L theta. Defining the error between the desired output and the calculated output. So I borrowed this picture from the Nelson's book. It, you know, it's like everyone knows this. So I guess I don't really have to put this one there. So what is deep filtering? Uh, so what we do is we generate a Monte Carlo samples. And then we use those samples to train a deep neural net, basically a number of layers, networks involved. And then the observation process is used as input to the deep neural net. And the state from the Monte Carlo samples is used as a target. And then we use the least square error of the target and calculate the output as a loss function for networks training to, to come with the, the, uh, the weighting vectors. Then these weighting vectors are used in another set of Monte Carlo samples and so on and so forth. And finally, we calculate the, the uh, DNN output. And this is what we term that deep filter, just going through the whole network, as you can see here, going through each stage. All right. So let's... Uh, get the setup uh, uh, put in here. So at, uh, uh, for simplicity, I'm going to look at a discrete time problem. So Xn is the state process such that Xn is given by this, <clears throat> whereas Un is the, the uh, system noise, all right? And we have the observation process is given by Yn, which has another uh, observation noise, uh, Vn. So uh, just remember Xn is the state, Yn is the observation. This is a sort of like a, a classical notation. And then we uh, use n seat to denote the number of training sample paths. We use n0 to denote the training window for each sample pass. And then you just, uh, you know, look at this. This is the input vector to the neural net. And the Xn is the target, is the state. And here, Cn is the neural net output. In fact, this one depends on theta. So I put a little theta in the, the superscript, but you can put that into the you know, parentheses, if you like. It's a theta dependent. So that's, the theta is the whole thing, in fact. Uh, so then you define this uh, 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 loss function or cost function you want to minimize. And then we basically just go on and try to work out the fil filtering problems. So what I'm going to talk about here is, uh, Several things. So first, we try to redo the common filter. And then we look at the extended common filter. And then we look at the state actually involve a switching or mark of switching process. And we'll see how that performance uh, or, or how the uh, uh, neural net, uh, this deep filtering tell us. So here I'm using the term uh, nominal model as an estimated model. And I'm using AM or actual model as the actual model. 
So now, you know, you remember that in the, when we do the filtering, we just, uh, you know, use uh, just, you know, a state and the state equation, also the observation equation. But here we have a two thing. One is the nominal model, is the estimated model. The other one is the actual one. The difference is really from the, the observation noise part, as you can see. All right, so let's first look at the common filter. I, I didn't uh, uh, put in many of uh, those uh, computational results. I didn't put in the, the, the time involved, but I can certainly provide that uh, if it's needed. So first, remember, AM is the actual model. So first, we fix the standard deviation or, or the variance of the actual model. And we let the nominal, you know, the variance of the nominal model change. It turns out the common filter depends heavily on nominal observation noise. But on the other hand, if you look at this, this DF is deep filtering of 10. On the top is the, you know, we, we uh, vary this uh, nominal uh, model, the standard deviation of the nominal model. And then you see the, the, uh, the common filter actually is uh, sensitive to the variation, whereas uh, the deep filtering is relatively robust in this regard. Now, then what we do is we, we let the uh, nominal model fixed, the, the uh, standard deviation fixed at the point five, and then we vary the uh, standard deviation of the actual model. Uh, as you can see, both the deep filtering and the common filter is getting worse. But the deep filter appears to be more robust than the common filter because it is less sensitive to such change than the common filter. All right. So now the second uh, related example for this part is that we are going to look at the nonlinear model. So we put in the nonlinearity as a sign function for the state. And uh, you see the only difference is uh, really the, uh, the variance part for the nominal model and for the, the actual model. All right, so then what happened? Now, again, uh, the deep filter is more robust and the less dependent on the nominal observation noise change when they're compared against the corresponding extended common filter. Because it's a nonlinear problem, we use an extended common filter here. Uh, when training the, the, the uh, deep filter, the, the uh, observation noise, uh, what we observed is the uh, observation noise in training data should not be too small because you have to generate enough variation uh, to allow the filter to catch up the actual the state. So this is the that, uh, case. Now the next one I'm going to look at is actually random switching involved. So we have a continuous time mark of chain alpha t uh, with two state, one and two. Just for simplicity, we, we are just trying to, you know, look at this. And uh, so the generator of the mark of chain is given by this Q. And then you have a nonlinear uh, system and, uh, and also the observation. So, now the, the thing is that uh, there is alpha dependence because of the switching. Oh, by the way, what is alpha n? Alpha n, in fact, is the skeleton of this. You, you basically take this at uh, 
discrete time, if you, you, if you use, uh, say, eta as a step size. All right. So uh, for sigma equal to 0.1, and uh, I mean sigma zero, and uh, 0.3, we generate two samples. Well, in this case, you know, uh, extended common filter is not going to work. It's common filter is out of the place as well. So now you get a two samples and then you can take the difference of those and you can see their performance. This is a pretty much like, you know, it's like a, um, for the moment there is a sort of preliminary study for the deep filtering, but it shows some uh, promising in terms of this approach. Now, the next uh, example I'm going to look at is a elliptic HJBs. Uh, this is the, again, very recent work. So we are looking at the following elliptic HJBs. So O is a domain with closure O bar. Consider an elliptic nonlinear HJB equation of the following form, fully nonlinear, with boundary condition like this. So you may wonder why is such problems arising from a stochastic control problem? Now, one of them may be one player stochastic control problem, then you have the control the diffusion, and you have a cost function, which is the expected value starting from t until the stopping time tau. Tau is the one actually you reach the boundary of that. And here is the, the terminal cost. Uh, so we have this problem. Then the associated value function is defined as follows, where A belongs to a certain admissible class, right? So now that's the, the one player stochastic control problems. Another associated problem would be two player game problem. So for the two player game problem, we have this, we have a two controls, uh, control for player one, control for player two. And, and then you can define the upper and the lower values as follows. It's a minimax kind of setup. Uh, all right, so why we want to consider such a problem because I, I think we see in the literature, most people using learning are treating uh, more parabolic equations than elliptic equations uh, of uh, this type. So that's, we got interested in that. So for the domain, we are going to look at that the d-dimensional in the cubic, like from zero to one. So it's product of space. And the equation on the, you know, on this uh, domain is something like this, where L or the running cost is given by this. And uh, you have the, well, we want to look at the, this problem because there is the closed form solution. Again, we are going to build some kind of um, benchmark first, and then we are going to look at some more complicated case. So how to solve this problem numerically? Well, we use a mesh H, set the interior and the boundary on the discrete domain as follows. So basically the idea what we are using is from the, basically use the idea from the uh, uh, Kushner's idea of a Markov chain approximation for a stochastic control problem. But then, uh, uh, you know, you can find that in Kushner and the Dupre's book. So whenever I write down U sub H, that's approximate solution. And the P of H is control the transition probability. So basically the idea of a Markov chain approximation is to build such uh, uh, recursive, uh, build a, such uh, numerical schemes that are consistent with the controlled diffusion. 
Um, so here there's some operators, but I don't really want to mention it. So we are using uh, the upper semi-continuous function and the lower continuous function. We use f superstar and the low f lower star as uh, upper semi-continuous and the lower semi-continuous envelopes of f. And uh, after that, we can look at the space of a super test function and the space of sub test functions as follows. So one of them, the super, uh, the super one is taking the, the inf and here we are taking the soup. And then we can define the viscosity subsolution property and the viscosity super solution property. We can define the corresponding viscosity sub and the super solutions. So the first algorithm is by value iteration. This is the really uh, classical. This is known to everyone in the audience, I think. So I don't need to say too much about it. But if you do the value iteration, you see that the memory you need for even the benchmark problem uh, is going to be the speak is of the order one over h to the power d, where d is the dimension, h is the step size. So if h is small, then the memory can be huge. So then uh, what we are thinking is maybe we can try to use a neural network to resolve the issue. So here, C is an activation function and uh, with a parameter set theta. So then it uh, comes to the second uh, pseudo algorithm, basically using the idea of uh, deep learning. So we set tolerance level, we set this uh, you know, thing like that, and we use a learning rate for this computation. Actually, we didn't quite use a constant. If you have a question, I can talk about more because I know in learning, people do pay attention to this uh, uh, learning rate. And then we go ahead and do this uh, stochastic gradient uh, sort of stuff and uh, return the result. So basically it's a kind of like, um, what I should say is, is uh, well, we, we are using that idea to solve the problem. All right, so you ask, pr probably you would like to ask, uh, or do you have a sort of uh, convergence result? Yes, we do. In fact, we do have a convergence result. So the basic idea is to use the upper and uh, lower, um, you know, envelopes uh, uh, to, and then use the sub and the super uh, viscosity solutions to sandwich this uh, approximation. And uh, finally, we can show this one converges to the true control we want to, to get to. So, uh, so the, in fact- George, just five yeah. minutes reminder. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I will finish that in five minutes. All right, thank you. So, I mean, this, uh, this upper, uh, semi-continuous envelope and the lower uh, semi-continuous envelopes of uh, U of H turns out to be uh, the sub and the super solutions. So I'm going to show some numerical result. Uh, I promise to finish on time. So the first approximation is for one dimensional thing. You know, we have a closed form solution in this case, so we can compare that. Uh, the exact solution. It shows pretty good match, as you can see. And uh, the, now the first one is, by the way, this one is using value iteration. This is a, perhaps a standard, but it is a low dimension, you can do that. The second one is using neural net. Uh, and, and then, this one shows that normally people in learning would like to ask you what is the epoch number versus loss function. Here you see it takes some time for the neural net to learn and it gets to stabilize. 
So what we have is weight is 100 and the three hidden, hidden layers and the eight neurons for each layer. So then this next one is a, is a two-dimensional problem. Now you also have an exact solution. We can uh, really just uh, you know, plot that. And then we can solve that by value iteration. We can also solve it by neural network approximation using neural net. So now the question is, however, there are pros and accounts for deep learning based approach. The deep learning based approach opens up the possibility for solving a class of high dimensional HGB equations. So you know that we did 1D and the 2D basically here, we are trying to use that as a, a benchmark example. We are currently working on high dimensional thing, but it, uh, so one of the problem is for multi-dimensional or state variable case, the robustness would be an issue and it, is, it really needs to be tested. Now, uh, so some further remarks, I'm pretty much on time. So uh, in this talk, I basically first uh, talk about two examples that leads to the high dimensional HABs. One of them is non-classical uh, LQ problem. Now the second problem is switching diffusion with mean field terms. And then we look at a couple of examples in filtering and the control using the idea of deep learning. Uh, so we basically explored uh, the deep neural networks by providing some preliminary experiment. As I told you, it's pretty new, actually, the result. Uh, in fact, very new. Uh, of course, a lot of more numerical tests and the high dimensional models need to be looked at. Uh, the neural net opens up uh, the possibility, but we still have to work hard on that part. All in all, my conclusion is that here we have more questions than answers. That's basically end my talk. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, George. So um, are there any questions? So, um, I don't see, uh, oh, wait, there is one, yes. Okay, wait, you can go. Okay, thank you. Somehow my, uh, this uh, raise hand function does not work this time. But anyway, uh, hey, George, I have uh, one question. Is that, can you go back to the uh, figure of the uh, deep learning future? And the deep filter simulation with jumps, yeah, uh, with switching, yeah. Uh, can I take a look at the graph one more time? Yeah, yeah okay, it just passed it. Yeah, yeah so this, this, is the, this is the model, uh -huh. Sorry. and n times that stuff, and uh, this. So you have a switching, right? Right. Yeah. So uh, go 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 to that graph. Yeah. So that, yeah. Okay. This graph. Uh, well, I mean, so it seems to me that there's no time delay even, you know, your filter for the first two graph A and B, it jumps immediately with a true jump. It's kind of against my, you know, intuitively, you usually take a little bit time to realize that you switch from another system. So the C and the D seems that it uh, is a little bit blurred there. You know, you're, this you're, is the two, two different. Uh, this is the one simple pass. This is another simple pass, right? It depends on the the uh, depends on the variance. Okay, yeah, right. yeah. Because the first two graph looks just a little bit too ideal to me. You know, they jump oh. so clearly. Usually, they have a little bit blurred around the the switching time. Well. Uh, you know that that's what we have. This uh, this uh, this uh, takes uh, two values, one the two, and mm -hmm. here you have a symmetric kind of a jump. 
between those two. Okay. So, so, so you are Mr. not. Krenner, you can uh, also talk. Yeah. All right, that's a good thing. You know? <laughs> yeah. But, so, uh, they basically it shows otherwise you have no way of uh, doing the filtering here. If. Yeah, we have can. some uh, some situation in in swamps uh, observability yeah. swamp UAVs, where there's some parameters. You know, you, you, there's a time window. Yeah, uh, if you use common filter, you pass the time window, then you never figure it out. So a common filter never works, just like your case, because observability happens on a manifold which has zero mirror. And I think this is, you know, in some sense, there's some link between them. But there, like, like our time window, have to choose very, very nicely. Otherwise, uh, we we have a big delay of finding that jump. So this jump looks very clear. So that's, I mean, that's a good thing. I'm just trying to figure. Yeah, out. yeah, sure. Okay. But uh, basically, yeah, the, the the common filter doesn't work here, or the yeah. extended common uh, filter. Uh, Albert, you can talk. Art. Can I talk? Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, George, very nice talk. I enjoyed yep. it very much. I had some questions. How deep was the neural network on the uh, on the learning, the deep learning model? And um, the other question uh, is, how, how long was the observation window of the output? Oh, you mean for, for, the, for the filtering? I think, I think the seed, we used 5,000. And uh, the uh, observation window was like, uh, What's that number? I think of fifty or so. You you so you 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 lag fifty observations. Yeah yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean I show you this uh, thing. So here the seed we use five thousand n zero. I think we use the uh, fifty. Fifty and uh, yeah. Huh. And and. Um, did you try any uh, uh, any place else to put the errors? I mean, all your errors were in the coefficient of the observation noise. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did we, you try uh, putting the errors in any other locations? Not, not yet. Uh, you know, for because that's the typical. You know, that's a, basically the common filter rewrite, right? I mean, uh, for similar for for extended common filter. Well, I was thinking uh, where, where the dynamics has a parameter in it, which yeah. you can treat as an extra state. Yeah. And uh, you would want to estimate that parameter uh, from observations, not of it, but of, uh, of, the of the dynamics of the rest of the variables. Yeah. Uh, that would be a little bit more complex, but I think it can be done. Uh, the difficulty is that the, currently the Markov chain, the switching thing, the Markov chain is known. If it's not known, then you need to build another Wunnem filter. Well, that, that becomes more complicated because that uh, observation part cannot be the switching dependent for the noise part. Yeah. So, otherwise, you don't have a finite dimensional filter. And how deep was your uh, learning, uh, your uh, deep neural net? I, I think it's three or four layers. It's not particularly deep. Yeah, no, no, not. Some people are saying if you put it too deep, it may not be too good, maybe over parameterize. I don't know, I mean, it's the... Of course, we need to do more, you know, uh, experiment on that. I mean, you, with with the um, with your dynamics, what's eta in the dynamics? Eta eta is the the step size. Yeah, and how big is that? Uh, eta, I think I I forgot the number. I think it's uh, something like point oh oh five or so. so yeah, point oh. The trajectories are moving relatively slowly. Yeah. And so if you have an average of them, you, you could just average the last 50 observations. Well, if you have the noise to be fast, the wiring, the average will, will take the noise out. Yeah, but your, your noises weren't outrageously big. No, no, not. not and, and with 50 samples, uh, 
and, and relatively slow dynamics. Um, I, you know, I, I'd like you to see a comparison between your filter, your deep filter, and just a, a simple averaging of the past observations. Oh, I see. Okay. Good suggestion. We could look into that. Okay. So um, I don't see any other questions. So uh, thanks again, George, for the presentation. Thank you.